This morning we're continuing in John's Gospel and now we're, we're sort of underway having gone through the uh, introduction. Now we begin to see something of the ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ as attention begins to be drawn to Him and away from John the Baptist. Uh, let me um, begin by reading the uh, text we're going to be looking at. And again, um, as we go through the Gospels, we'll find that we're going to cover sometimes a significant amount of ground in, in one sermon. Other times we may need to focus on just a verse or two at a time. But uh, we're biting off a big chunk this morning and looking at verses 35 through 51. Let me read that for you as we begin. Again, the next day, John was standing with two of his disciples. And he looked at Jesus as he walked and said, Behold, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. And Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, What do you seek? They said to him, Rabbi, which translated means teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, Come, and you will see. So they came and saw where he was staying, and they stayed with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. One of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which translated means Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which is translated Peter. The next day he purposed to go into Galilee, and he found Philip. And Jesus said to him, Follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida of the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said to him, Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him and said of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? Jesus answered and said to him, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus answered and said to him, Because I said to you that I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, you will see the heavens opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. May the Lord bless this word to our hearing this morning. Now again, last week we were looking at uh, John's testimony about Jesus. Remember, John's ministry had gained a, a great deal of attention, so much so that the Pharisees in Jerusalem sent some priests and Levites out to John to find out who it is he claimed to be. They asked him, are you the Christ? And he said, no. Are you Elijah or the prophet? And again he said, no. So who are you? John said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as Isaiah the prophet said. Well, why then are you baptizing if you are not any of these men? By what authority do you do these things? Well, the reason why John was baptizing was, as he said, to prepare the way for the Lord. That's why he was preaching, why he was telling the people they needed to repent. That's why he was baptizing them with a baptism of repentance. If they sincerely desire to turn from their sins and to prepare themselves for the coming of the Lord, that's what they needed to submit to. He was trying to get the people ready to receive the one who was coming, the one whom John said was able to baptize with the Spirit, which means he was able to make spiritually alive those who were dead. He is able to forgive sins and to give the power to break the chains of sin and to live a godly life. Uh, one was coming, John said, who was so holy that he wasn't even worthy to loosen the, you know, the thong of his sandal, not even worthy to take his sandals off. This one who was coming, who was able to baptize with the Spirit of God, who is himself, of course, a divine person, had to be God himself. So he went out to get them ready to receive their Messiah, whom he's already told us is the Son of God. 
Now, this morning we see that John's ministry was actually bearing fruit. Some were listening to John and coming to Jesus and following Jesus. And we see that those who listened and went out to Jesus immediately went out and found others who needed him and brought them to Jesus as well. Now, basically, this is how the Lord was at work to gather his sheep to himself. And more particularly in this case, those who would be his apostles. And basically that's what I want us to see this morning. I want us to see this process that was ongoing and how it is that Jesus was gathering his sheep together, what it is that was true of his sheep that were gathered to him. And of course, um, to see that we're a part of that process. Jesus wants to use us also to go and gather his sheep to himself. Now we're going to see a number of other things as well, but that is the main thing I want us to see. Now first we see fruit in John's ministry as he was pointing to Jesus. Remember that is why the Lord sent him out, was that he might prepare the people, that he might point the way to Jesus. I'm baptizing with water, but one is coming after me who can baptize with the Spirit. Well we see again John being given that opportunity to point to Jesus in verses 35 and 36. Again the next day John was standing with two of his disciples and he looked at Jesus as he walked and said, Behold, the Lamb of God. So Jesus again appears where John was baptizing. And John saw him and the two who were with him. And he says, look, there is the Lamb of God. Now again, not only do we see John doing what it is that God had sent him to do, but we also see something else that is true about Jesus. Uh, not only is he able to baptize with the Spirit, which again is the only way that anyone can be made alive and Jesus is the only one who can actually give him. This one also came to give his life in place of our own. John is pointing to him as God's Passover lamb. The one that that feast celebrated every year. The sacrifice that God provided to take away our sins. Now again, we ask the question, why should we point to Jesus? Well, we should point to him for a variety of reasons. You know, that's what God calls us to do. He is the Messiah. He is the Son of God. He is the one who baptizes with the Spirit, who alone can do that, who is able to change the heart. But John is now pointing us to the fact that Jesus alone is able to take away our sins. How can a man be right with God? How can a man be forgiven of all the crimes he has committed against God? There is only one way. There is only one payment that will do. And it is the payment that Jesus has made as the sacrificial lamb of God. Peter writes in 1 Peter 1 verses 17 through 19. If you address as father the one who impartially judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves in fear during the time of your stay on earth knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers, but with precious blood, as of a lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is the one with the authority to give the Spirit of God. He alone can do that. The Spirit alone can give life. But Jesus is the Lamb of God who alone offers the sacrifice, the atonement, the price that is due to God's justice for the forgiveness of sins. Is it any wonder that Jesus will later say in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Jesus is the only way, which is the reason why we need to point to Jesus. There are not many ways to God, there is only one. And I would just remind those of you this morning who haven't come to Jesus, again, that he is the only way. And you know that, and you've heard that. You need to come to him. Only he can grant you his spirit. Only he can forgive your sins. He is the only way to the Father. If you want to go to heaven and not to hell, you must trust him. Now again, that's what John was saying. That's what he was doing. He was pointing to Jesus. Did anyone listen to him? You know, we don't actually 
hear about you know, many doing this, but we do see that little by little people began to catch on. What John was saying is true. Were there people who listened to him? Well, yes, there were. Verse 37, the two disciples heard him speak and they followed Jesus. Again, reminding us that this is how people are brought to Jesus. This pointing to Jesus, this gospel which he has given to us is the message God uses to bring others to himself. You know, you don't even have to prove that it's true to somebody else. Although sometimes, you know, we get into those debates and arguments. We use apologetics. We are to be ready at all times to give a defense for the hope that is within us. But let's not get too caught up in defending the gospel, as we've been reminded on numerous occasions. Let's use the gospel. Just simply proclaim what the message is, because that is the message God uses to save John didn't have to prove that Jesus was the Messiah. He simply pointed to him and said, there he is. Follow him. Now you realize not everyone that you tell is going to come to him. John pointed many, many people to Jesus. Not all of them came to Jesus, but a few did listen. And a few did follow him. And that shouldn't surprise us because Jesus says, in Matthew 22, verse 14, many are called, but few are chosen. There's going to be many more people who are going to hear the gospel than are actually going to be saved by the gospel. Uh, many seeds of the gospel have been sown over the centuries, but only very little of it has fallen on good soil. I mean, consider how many people you know that have come to church how many people you know who have heard the gospel? How many people you know that were actually raised in Christian households under the gospel their entire lives? And yet of all the people who have heard, there really aren't that many who have believed. But some have. Now, Jesus never told us to expect that everyone would be saved. But he did tell us to expect some. And those are the ones, of course, that we are going out for. Of course, we're going out for everyone because we do love our neighbor. We are to love our neighbor as ourselves. We are to call everyone to faith and repentance. Our hope is that all of them would come. But we're not to expect that they are all going to come. But we are to expect that some will. Now, here are two that did. John pointed, the Spirit worked, and these two came to Jesus. And what is it that Jesus did when he saw these two coming after him? Well, he invited them to follow, verses 38 and 39. And Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, What do you seek? And they said, Rabbi, which translated means teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, Come and you will see. So they came and saw where he was staying, and they stayed with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. Now what is Jesus going to do if you come to him? or when you come to him, when you come to him in faith, if you're willing to turn from your sins and trust in him, he'll do the same thing he did for these men. He will receive you. He will invite you to follow. Uh, Jesus reminds us in John 6, verse 37, all that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will certainly not cast out. You know, the Bible encourages us that we, we should never be afraid that Jesus will not accept us, that Jesus will not receive us if we come to him. If you are willing to come to him on his terms, which means letting go of your sins, and again, not sin as you define it, but sin as God defines it in his word. If you're willing to let go of your sins, if you're willing to trust Jesus Christ and make him your whole hope of heaven, he is willing to receive you because if you're willing to do that, it shows that the Father has given you to Jesus. And if the Father has given you to Jesus, Jesus isn't going to, to turn you aside. He's not going to cast you out when you come to him. He's warmly going to welcome you. And he will graciously forgive you. And he will, as we saw in Psalm 23, guide you in the paths of his righteousness. But now the second thing I want you to see is I want you to notice what one of these two men did before they began to follow Jesus. One of them sought out his brother and invited him to come along as well in verses 40 through 42. One of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, 
Simon Peter's brother. He, first found, uh, he found first his own brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which translated means Christ. He brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which is translated Peter. Now, when we find the Lord, or we should say more accurately, uh, when the Lord finds us, it changes us in more ways than one. Not only do we want to follow Jesus Christ, but we want others to follow Jesus as well. Now, we see that Andrew's heart had been opened by the Spirit of God to see who Jesus was and to receive Jesus. But the Spirit also gave him something beyond that, something he gives to every one of his followers, compassion for his neighbor, to love him as he loves himself. In this case, his neighbor being his brother, Simon. Now, we do need to remember that Christianity isn't just about us. It's not just between me and God, as it were. It's not a private religion, something that we do in secret. But Christianity is something we are to do openly. It's something that we are to express openly. Again, there were those who were secret disciples for fear of the Pharisees, but Jesus says, if you deny me before men, I'll deny you before my Father. His will for us is to express him and to proclaim him openly. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5, verses 14 through 15, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on the lampstand. And it gives light to all who are in the house. You see, Christianity is all about following Jesus' example. To reach those who are around you with the gospel so that they too might find the kingdom of heaven. By his grace, find it to be the pearl of great price. The treasure hidden in the field and give everything they have that they might possess that treasure as well and have with it eternal life. Now the fact that Andrew had that desire to share that treasure with someone else showed that he knew the Lord. And when you find within yourself that desire to share that treasure with others, it also gives you strong encouragement that you belong to the Lord and that you have entered into his kingdom. Now, it's interesting to note that when you do obey your Lord and submit to him in in doing this work, you just never know what's going to happen, how the Lord is going to use you in his kingdom in bringing others to Jesus. Now, we already know that there's going to be many who are going to reject Jesus, but there are going to be those who receive him. And among those who receive him, uh, the Lord may actually call somebody special. Now, we do know that all of God's people are special. I mean, Jesus laid down his life for us, not because we were worthy, but because he placed value on us, because he loved us, the Bible tells us, uh, before the world was created. It has everything to do with his love for us. It has nothing to do with us, but we are special because of that love. But we do understand that there are some that God has used in in a uh, more special way, if I can put it that way. For instance, the apostles and the prophets but there are even some among them who were distinguished. And I think such was the case here. When Andrew brought his brother to Jesus, we read in John 1 verse 42, Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which is translated Peter. Now again, we're going to see a little bit more about this, so actually we already have. I'm not, I'm not gonna go into the, you know, the explanation of Matthew 16 with regard to these rocks and so forth. But I do want you to understand that Cephas is Aramaic for the Greek word Petros, which is where you get the word Peter or the name Peter. And both words basically mean a a stone or a rock. Jesus basically says, you were Simon, but you will be called a rock. And not because Jesus thought that Peter was particularly dense, but Because Jesus would later use Peter and his confession to build his church. Now, it may be true that that the Lord hasn't given us the greatest gifts. 
Maybe we're not personally going to bear as much fruit as other people have for his glory in the church or as much as we like. I think the heart of every true Christian is they want to bear fruit for the Lord. They want to do as much as they can. But we have to recognize there are some God has called that he will use more than others. But even though we may not have the great gifts, we may yet be used by the Lord to bring someone to himself that does have those gifts. I think you've probably heard this illustration on a number of occasions, but Spurgeon himself was actually brought to faith in Christ, not by some great evangelist, not by some uh, great gifted man that the Lord was using, but by some poor guy who was filling the pulpit on a particular Sunday because the pastor couldn't make it to church. There was too much snow. He got snowed in. And I, uh, Spurgeon, as he, as he remarks about his own conversion, was the man opened the, the Bible and read this text, looked to Jesus and after 10 minutes, he had basically said everything he could think of saying. And then he began to look at the people who had gathered there. And he looked at Spurgeon and, he's, and he said to Spurgeon, you need to look to Jesus. And you know what? The Lord used that one word, look. Suddenly, it became sweet to Spurgeon. And he was converted by the efforts of this man who didn't have great gifts, didn't have great education, was just simply trying to be used by the Lord on that particular occasion and get people to look to Jesus, and the Lord used him. The Lord might use us to bring someone he may use mightily. And you know what, I think that the man that the Lord used to bring Spurgeon to Christ is also going to share in that reward that Spurgeon has because he was instrumental in bringing Spurgeon to him. And I think that's one of the reasons why you really don't receive your reward until the day of judgment. The day of judgment doesn't come until everything has been said and done. Because you don't know, uh, and really everything, all the fruitfulness of, of your life isn't going to uh, be realized until the very last day. You know, what you do can have consequences for, for generations of people. And you're going to receive a reward for all of that. So don't look just to your own gifts and what you're able to do you know, with how many people you're able to bring to Christ. Just think about the fact that the Lord may use you to bring someone who will bear more fruit and you'll be able to share in their labors as well because you were instrumental in bringing them to Christ. Now the great shepherd was gathering his sheep through John and through those who came to him through John's testimony. But what I also want you to see that the great shepherd himself was going out to gather his sheep personally. We read in verses 43 through 44. The next day he purposed to go into Galilee and he found Philip. And Jesus said to him, follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Jesus had left Bethany where John was baptizing and he went into Galilee. And there he sought a particular man by the name of Philip. Now Philip was from Bethsaida. Interestingly, where Andrew and Peter also lived. It's quite possible that all these men uh, already knew each other. Likely they did. But when he found Philip, he, he called him also to follow him. Now why did Jesus do that? Why did Jesus go out and personally call Philip? Was Philip more important than, than Andrew? Was he more important than Peter? Is that why Jesus went to him rather than the other way around? Well, I don't, I don't think so. I think during Jesus' earthly ministry, he was sent to gather his sheep, and that's exactly what he was doing now that his ministry was underway. Uh, we see in the case of Zacchaeus, I love to read this story of Zacchaeus, where... Um, uh, you know, Jesus was entering into Jericho and there was a man who wanted to see him and Jesus calls him. But you see, he didn't call him to be an apostle. This is just what Jesus was doing at this particular juncture. But let's read about that in Luke's Gospel, chapter 19, verses 1 through 10. Uh, he that is Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. And there was a man called by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and he was rich. Zacchaeus was trying to see who Jesus was and was, uh, was unable because of the crowd for he was small in stature. So he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree in order to see him for he was about to pass through that way. When Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down for today I must stay at your house. And he hurried and came down and received him gladly. When they saw it, they all began to grumble saying, he has gone to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. Zacchaeus stopped and said to the Lord, 
Behold, Lord, half of my possessions I will give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I will give him back four times as much. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because he too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Now the interesting thing is here, when Jesus was on earth, he could personally seek his own, and that's exactly what he did. He went and he was calling his lost sheep to himself. But now that he's in heaven, we need to realize that he still does that work. But now he's doing it in a different way, through his people. Remember, the book of Acts is all about the continuing work of Jesus Christ through his church. It's not about the work of his church. It's what Jesus is now doing through his church. And though the book of Acts did come to an end at the end of the several chapters, documenting that time between you know, Jesus' resurrection and the time when Jesus would come in judgment against Jerusalem, the book of Acts, in a certain sense, is continuing because it's continuing through us. We need to remember that anyone who comes to Jesus comes to him for the same reason that uh, Philip did when Jesus came to him and said, follow him. They come because Jesus is seeking them. That's why you came to him, because of his work in seeking you through someone else. John reminds us in 1 John 4.19, we love because he first loved us. When we come to Jesus Christ, it's because he is seeking us. He may not do it personally, but he is doing it by his spirit through his people whom he has called to himself. He calls them to reach you in his name as he calls us to reach others in his name. But it is the work of Jesus. He is seeking his sheep. And then finally, we see Philip do what Andrew had done earlier. He also went and invited someone else to come to Jesus. We read in, in verses 45 through 46. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him of whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said to him, Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. Now, one thing I should mention at this point is, I, I don't know that all these men were necessarily unconverted uh, before they came to Jesus. They were in a certain sense. I mean, they hadn't yet become Christians. We, we see that there were God-fearers who hadn't received the Spirit of God because they hadn't heard about Jesus Christ and Cornelius and those believers that were in Ephesus that only knew about John the Baptist. I believe these men were Old Testament believers, uh, even as Simeon, uh, who was ministering in the temple waiting for the Lord to fulfill His promise to send His Christ. I mean, they trusted God. They believed His promises and they were waiting. So I don't think that these men didn't necessarily know the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, they were ready and waiting for him to come. And when he came, they received him. But still, I want you to see they, they came to him. They had this desire. Jesus may have been working through other means before he actually came and called Philip. He was working through the Old Testament prophets. He was working through the law. And that law had its work upon their hearts. And they were ready and waiting for the Messiah. But that was still Jesus' work, wasn't it? In working through the Old Testament to get them ready. And this was certainly his work in calling them personally. And this is certainly his work when he uses one of his people to reach out to someone else. That's what was happening here with all these men. And now we're looking at Nathaniel. I want you to notice one thing about Nathaniel. He was skeptical. But I also want you to notice that Jesus overcame his skepticism. Nathanael says in verse 46, when Philip comes to him, Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. Now, Nathanael um, didn't want to believe that the Messiah could possibly come out of Nazareth. And I don't think it's, it's because of what we usually hear. Well, Nazareth had a bad reputation. A lot of bad things were going on there. It was a seedy place. I mean, that's where Jesus grew up. That's where Joseph and Mary raised their son. Uh, I don't think it was because of that, but it was because, I think Nathaniel said that because he understood that the prophet said that Messiah was going to come from Bethlehem and not from Nazareth. 
Uh, may there also, some have suggested there may have been a little bit of rivalry as um, Nathaniel, you know, everybody has their sort of pride in their particular town and village. And some people looked at other towns with dispersion. But I think primarily the, mi the main reason was because of what Micah wrote in Micah 5.2. But as for you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you one will go forth from me to be ruler in Israel. His goings forth are from long ago, from the days of eternity. The Messiah is in Nazareth. He comes from Nazareth. The scriptures say he's going to come from Bethlehem. Philip says, come and see. Even though he had his doubts, he was willing to listen to Philip and come. Sometimes people aren't convinced right away by what you have to tell them. Don't give up. Bring them to Jesus. Let them see for themselves. Once Nathanael came to Jesus, Jesus convinced him that he was the Messiah. Now, how did he do that? Well, first of all, by pointing out Nathanael's integrity. Verse 47. Behold an Israelite indeed in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael asked him, how do you know me? Then Jesus said something that apparently only Nathanael could have known about in verse 48. Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Now we already saw the example earlier of how Spurgeon's eyes had been opened when the preacher looked at him and said, look to Jesus. And that's all it took. And Spurgeon was converted. We read of other uh, examples like this where Augustine, who was unconverted, was in a friend's garden. And he heard some child across the wall playing some kind of a game and, you know, that said, take up and read, take up and read. And he happened to have in his hands the, 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 the letter of Paul to the Romans. And he opened it up and he looked down and, and Paul says, you know, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make, make no provision in your flesh with regard to its lust. And at that moment... Augustine was converted. Jesus just simply had to say these words to Nathanael. He told him something about Nathanael that Nathanael knew that only the Messiah could know. And his eyes were opened. And he immediately recognized Jesus as the Messiah. I'm not saying that every conversion is exactly like this. Sometimes it's a process. I'm sure there was a process going on here. I've already mentioned there was. But that moment, there is a moment of conversion and I think this was the moment for Nathaniel. He says in verse 49, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. This is how the Lord works. He works supernaturally. He works through His Word. He works by His Holy Spirit. And when He does that work, it happens in a moment. You don't have to really prove anything to anyone. All you have to do is simply declare the gospel to them. And God can work through it. Don't be afraid to tell other people because it seems maybe like there's really no way they're going to believe. Jesus is able to open the eyes of the blind. And he does it when and where he wills. And he doesn't in an instance. Now, Jesus is not only able to open the eyes of the blind on very slim evidence. He's able to give you more evidence as well to give you an even fuller conviction. Jesus says to Nathanael in verses 50 and 51, because I said to you that I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, truly, truly, I say to you, you will see the heavens opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Now, I think it is interesting that throughout Scripture we see Jesus again and again denying evidence Denying proof, uh, denying, as it were, miracles. He doesn't sort of, uh, you know, um, uh, perform on command, as it were, when he's in the presence of his enemies. If they're not going to believe him because of what the scriptures say, if, if they're not going to believe him on the basis of works that he's already done and the things that he's already said, he's not going to continue to cast his pearl before swine to have them trampled under his feet. Jesus doesn't give more evidence to people who don't believe so that they can reject that evidence as, of course, the Pharisees did when they saw Jesus cast out the demon. The first thing they said is, well, he's in league with the devil. If that's what they're going to do with, with evidence, Jesus isn't going to give them any more. But that isn't true with regard to people who do believe. 
Jesus gives more to them. Like Jacob who saw the vision of the ladder reaching to heaven and the angels of God ascending and descending from the Lord to minister to him, Jesus says to Nathanael that he would see the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man to minister to him, to minister through him, and to bring, as it were, fresh revelations of God's word and miracles. Jesus did what he did, completely dependent upon the power of God as it were, the Father and the Holy Spirit and perhaps even his own divine nature. But remember, Jesus being fully man was dependent upon them for that information, for those revelations and the ability to do those miracles. He says to Nathaniel, you're going to see that, Nathaniel. You're going to see far greater things than this, than just what I told you. When you trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, when you believe his word, Jesus will give you more he will give you a fuller evidence to refresh your faith and to bring it, as it were, to its greatest strength. So now what have we seen in, in this section? Uh, we've seen a few things. The Lord is continually seeking his people. He does that even today. Here he sought and he found four of his 12 apostles, Peter and Andrew, Philip and Nathaniel. Now, I already mentioned to you, if, if Nathaniel doesn't sound familiar to you, it's because he is known by another name. And that name is probably unfamiliar to us as well. Uh, Bartholomew. He was one of the Lord's apostles. By the way, when you, when you look in Scripture, not always, but very often, it's paired together with Philip. So Nathaniel is basically Bartholomew. You know, I used to read the Gospel of John. I always used to wonder, what happened to Nathaniel? Why don't we read about him again anywhere in Scripture? Well, we do. He was following the Lord everywhere he went. He was one of those 12 the Lord was using. So he didn't just have this encounter with Nathaniel and just forget about him. Nathaniel was one of his people. Now, we've also seen while he was on earth, he sought his own through others. He sought his own personally. And we've seen that now that he is in heaven, he does so through his people. He does so through you and through me. And we've seen that when he finds his people, his people do two things. They follow him and they try to get others to follow him. And finally, to those he finds by giving light, he gives a greater light to strengthen their faith. Now, on the basis of this, let me ask you a few questions in closing. Has the Lord sought you has he found you? Does your life demonstrate that he has found you by the fact that you're following him? Are you following Jesus Christ? Are you trying to, as Andrew did and as Philip did, are you trying to draw other people to Jesus Christ? Are you trying to help them find him as well? Do you find the Lord Jesus Christ refreshing your faith and strengthening your faith with, as it were, fresh revelations from his word and even in your own life of his supernatural uh, working. Well, if those things are true of you, then the Lord has found you. He has had mercy upon you. But if, he, if those things aren't true of you, if he hasn't found you, I would again urge you to come to him. Maybe I should just use the words that the, uh, the preacher did to Spurgeon. Look to Jesus. You see, that's all that's necessary. Look to him in faith. Turn from your sins and be willing to receive him as your Savior because only Jesus can give you his Spirit to make you alive. He alone can baptize with the Spirit of God. And if you don't have the Spirit, you cannot do this. Only he can forgive your sins. He is the only sacrifice that God has given, the only one he will accept. I would encourage you not to live another day in danger of hell. Nobody knows, no man, no woman, no child, knows the date of their death. We only know that it comes for every one of us. If you were to die now, would you go into the presence of the Lord or would you go into hell forever? If you haven't trusted Jesus, you are in danger of hell. So come to Jesus to secure your future and then Submit to him as a tool in his hands to be used to gather others into the kingdom of heaven. 
May the Lord grant each of us grace to hear his word this morning. Let's bow in a moment of prayer and ask the Lord to apply his word to us.